Chapter 9 Tennyson, self-styled prophet of the god Alsaeus, scowled at the platter that had been placed in front of him. The meagre contents, a small piece of stringy salted beef and a few withered carrots and turnips, did nothing to lighten his mood. Tennyson was a man who enjoyed his creature comforts. But now he was cold and uncomfortable, and worst of all, hungry. He thought bitterly of the Hibernian smuggler who had put him and his party ashore on the wild west coast of Picta. He had demanded an exorbitant fee from the outsiders, and, after a great amount of haggling, had grudgingly agreed to provide them with provisions for their overland journey south. When the time had come for them to disembark, they had been virtually manhandled off the ship like so much unwanted ballast, and half a dozen sacks had been tossed onto the beach after them. By the time Tennyson had discovered that at least a third of the food provided in the sacks was spoiled and inedible, the smuggler's ship was already well offshore, sweeping over the rolling waves like a gull. He raged impotently on the beach, picturing the smuggler laughing to himself as he counted the gold coins he had extorted from them. At first, Tennyson was tempted to claim the largest share of the small store of food for himself, but caution prevailed. His hold over his followers was tenuous. None of them were abject believers in Alsaeus. These were the hard core of his group, his fellow criminals, who knew that the outsider's cult was nothing more than an opportunity to extort money from simple country folk. They saw Tennyson as their leader only because he was skilled in convincing gullible farmers and villagers to part with their money. But at the moment, there were no farmers or villagers nearby and they felt no sense of deference to the bulky, grey-haired man in the flowing white robe. He might be their leader, but right now he wasn't returning any profit to them, so he didn't deserve any more than the rest of them. The truth was, he needed them as much as they needed him. Things were different when they were surrounded by several hundred converts, eager to pander to Tennyson's every whim. When that was the case... They all lived high off the hog, and none higher than he. But now? Now he would have to share with the rest. He heard footsteps approaching and looked up, the sour expression still on his face. Bakari, the senior of the two Genovesan assassins, still remaining in his employ, stopped a few paces away. He smiled sarcastically at the platter of food on Tennyson's knee, Not exactly a feast, your holiness. Tennyson's brow darkened in anger. He needed the Genovesans, but he didn't like them. They were arrogant and self-centred. When he ordered them to carry out a task, they did so with an air of reluctance, as if they were doing him a favour. He'd paid them well to protect him, and he expected that they might show him a little deference but that was a concept that seemed beyond them. Did you find anything? he asked. The assassin shrugged. There's a small farm about three kilometres away. There are animals there, so we'll have meat at least. Tennyson had sent the two Genovesans to scout the surrounding area. What little food they had remaining was almost inedible, and they were going to have to find more. Now, at the mention of fresh meat, his spirits lifted. Vegetables? Flour? Grain? he asked. Bakari shrugged again. It was an infuriating movement, Tennyson thought. It conveyed a world of disdain for the person being addressed. Possibly, Bakari said. It seems like a prosperous little place. Tennyson's eyes narrowed. Prosperous might equate with well-populated. How many people? Bakari made a dismissive gesture. Two people so far as I could see, he said. We can handle them easily. Excellent! Tennyson rose to his feet with renewed enthusiasm. 
He looked at the distasteful contents of the platter and hurled them into the heather beside the track. Rolf! he called to his chief henchman. Get everyone ready to move. The Genovesans have found us some food. The band began preparing to move out. The mention of food had heartened all of them. The surly looks and angry muttering that had become the norm for the past few days were gone. Amazing what the prospect of a full belly would do for people's spirits, Tennyson thought. It was a well-kept thatched cottage with a barn beside it. Smoke rose in a lazy curl from the chimney. A cultivated field showed the green tops of vegetables growing, kale or cabbage, Tennyson surmised. As they approached, a man emerged from the barn, leading a black cow behind him on a rope. He was clad in the typical attire of the region. A long plaid covering his upper body and a heavy kilt wrapped around his waist. He didn't notice them at first, but when he did, he stopped in his tracks, the cow dropping its head to graze the long grass. Tennyson raised his hand in a sign of peace and continued towards the Scotty farmer. Rolf and his other followers spread out in a line either side of him. Bakari and Marisi, the second Genovesan, stayed close by him, a pace behind him. Both had their crossbows unslung and held unobtrusively close to their sides. The farmer turned and called back to the house. A few seconds later, a woman appeared at the door and moved to join her husband standing ready to defend their home against these strangers. We come in peace, Tennyson called. We mean you no harm. The farmer replied in his native tongue. Tennyson had no idea what the words were, but the meaning was clear. Stay away. The man stooped and drew something from the leather-bound legging on his right leg. He straightened and they could see a long, black bladed dirk in his hand. Tennyson smiled reassuringly and continued to move forward. We need food, he said. We'll pay you well for it. He had no intention of paying and no idea if the farmer could understand the common tongue he spoke in. Probably not this far away from civilization. The important thing was the soothing and placating tone but the farmer wasn't convinced. He turned and shoved the cow violently, attempting to herd it back to the shelter of the barn. The black animal raised its head in alarm and began to wheel heavily away. Kill him, Tennyson said quietly. Almost immediately, he heard the slap whiz of the two crossbows and two bolts streaked across the field to bury themselves in the man's back. He threw up his hands, gave a choked cry, and fell face down in the grass. His wife uttered a scream and dropped to her knees beside him, speaking to him, trying to rouse him. But Tennyson knew from the way the man had fallen that he was dead when he hit the ground. It took a minute or so for the woman to come to the same realisation. When she did, she came to her feet screamed what was obviously a curse at them, and turned to run. She had gone three paces when Bikari, who had reloaded, shot again and sent her sprawling face down a few metres from her husband. The cow, unnerved by the shouting and the metallic smell of blood, stood uncertainly, swaying its head, offering a half-hearted threat to the approaching strangers. Nolan, a burly man who was one of Tennyson's inner circle, moved forward and seized the cow's halter, bringing it under control. The cow looked at him curiously, then Nolan slashed his knife across its throat. Blood jetted out, and the cow staggered a few paces before its legs gave way and it collapsed into the grass. The outsiders stood around the thrashing animal in a circle, regarding it with satisfaction. There would be enough meat there to keep them fed for some time. Clean it and joint it, Tennyson told Nolan. 
Before joining Tennyson's band, the big man had worked as a butcher. He nodded contentedly. Give me a hand, he ordered the three of the men around him. He'd need them to hold the carcass steady while he skinned and butchered it. Tennyson left him to the task and strode into the farmhouse. The doorway was low and he had to bow his head to enter. A quick search revealed a supply of potatoes, turnips and onions. His men gathered them up while he sent another two to pick some of the cabbages growing in the cultivated field. He looked around the neat little house. He was tempted to spend the night here under a roof for a change. But he had no idea if the farmer might have friends living nearby. It would be safer to gather up the food and keep moving. Another of his followers met him as he emerged from the house. There are two more beasts in the barn, he said. Do we want them? Tennyson hesitated. They had plenty of meat now, as well as the potatoes and onions from the house. If they were to carry anything more, it would only slow them down. He glanced across to where Nolan was already working on the carcass. He'd stripped the skin away and laid it on the grass. He'd gutted and cleaned the body and was cutting the meat into joints, piling them on the bloodied skin. No, he said, burn the barn when we leave, and the house. There was no real reason to burn them, he thought. But then there was no reason not to either. And the act of wanton destruction would go a long way towards restoring his good spirits. The outsider nodded. Then he hesitated, not sure what Tennyson intended. And the cows? he asked. Tennyson shrugged. If he couldn't use them, he didn't see any sense leaving them for anyone else. Burn them in it, 